What's up? Welcome in Hogan Johns back with you with some reaction to the early stages of free agency for the Chicago Bears. What's up, Johnsy? What's going on? Which, how do you like to phrase it? Negotiation window? The legal tampering period? I, I don't like that one, but which one do you prefer? Uh, I just call it the negotiation window. Yes. Because that's yes. what it is. Can we just call free agency? Yeah, or free agency. It doesn't really matter. It used to be like more of a act. Like, I do remember like the moves used to not really happen until the start of the new league year. And then like a few years ago, it just the floodgates opened the second the negotiating window happened. And the, the league just kind of let it go. And that's what it is. So everything will be official at three o'clock. Today, we're recording Wednesday morning. The Bears have made a few moves. No major splashes, really. Um, but we're going to talk about what has been done so far, what hasn't been done so far, and uh, a couple ex-Bears players that have moved on to surprisingly bigger contracts with other teams, which I think needs to be talked about as well. You can follow us on Twitter, at Adam Hogue, at Adam Johns. The show account is at Hogan Johns as well. You can go to HoganJohns.com. And find all of our merch, including this golf polo I'm wearing today. Great time of year to get those and get on the golf course. Which, of course, it's going to be 70 degrees in Chicago in the middle of free agency. Couldn't just wait like one more week. <laughs> but 40 on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Classic. I mean, that's Chicago. Chicago being Chicago for you. Nothing will be the legendary year of 2012. I think it was 2012. When it was like 75 degrees in St. Patrick's Day, and the city was just oh yeah, overflowing in green. <laughs> yep. My wife and I were downtown for that one. We enjoyed that beautiful day. I think Wisconsin beat Syracuse in the NCAA yeah, tournament. Yes, that it, day. it was like a like a perfect combination of like events, like great weather, yeah. St. Patrick's Day, the beautiful city of Chicago, and March of Madness all yeah. in one day. Yeah, it was a great day. And it's been in the 30s and 40s ever since I'd say Pat's sometimes rainy sometimes yeah. snowy I think they should just move that holiday to the summer be more fun well there are halfway to St. Patrick's Day parties in some places <laughs> of the city that's true um all right well let's talk about some of these uh why don't we start with what I think is the biggest splash and that is DeAndre Swift um interesting running back market I still think I, I honestly, John, I think some of this has been misconstrued because I think the top of the running back market has actually still been depressed a little bit. I mean, what happened with Aaron Jones is very interesting, you know, um, and he ends up getting released and then signing with the Vikings. Saquon got paid uh, more, but I think what we just sort of saw is sort of in that middle ground, the middle of the running back market, which is where I would put DeAndre Swift. Maybe that got a little bit more of a bump like compared to where David Montgomery was a year ago, where he got about six per year and Swift can earn up to eight per year. Um, and it's a little bit of an interesting shift by the bears too, after not keeping David Montgomery last year, but they tried to, but they didn't. They thought quite. they had a competitive offer for David Montgomery. Yeah. But obviously not competitive enough. He leaves running back production goes down a little bit. Now they go sign a guy that did run for a thousand yards last year with the Philadelphia Eagles. I think the decision to sign Swift is the result of a few things. I think the Bears definitely wanted to improve that running back room. I think that's why they had conversations even with Saquon Barkley. They wanted a bit more, I don't know, juice in that in, in that room, like a little bit more star star power to to go a longer way with what they want to be offensively. I felt like they've been that way for a couple of years now because they did want to keep David Montgomery. Um, and then like my other takeaway of this whole running back like situation is I think the Bears should be thankful that Aaron Jones while still in the division is no longer part of the Green Bay Packers because I just like every game that the Bears played against the Packers like he was such a matchup problem with what with whatever the Bears threw at him yeah unfortunately still in the division though <laughs> unfortunately but I would take him with Minnesota. the Vikings and Sam Darnold over well Jordan Love or Aaron Rodgers right yeah um. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I think. Look, when you watch the Packers, they they were a different team when Aaron Jones, um, 
was out. And remember, he got hurt week one against the Bears, kind of pulled his hamstring, and then took him a long time to get back to where he was at. Now, for the move that they made um, to go out and 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 grab uh, Josh Jacobs, I mean, they're to me they're very different running backs, and and Jacobs isn't quite the same guy in my opinion. So I do think that they. You know, I understand the move that they made there, but that is to me that's a that's a step below. Whereas I think I think the Vikings got considerably better at the position by adding Aaron Jones, assuming he's healthy. And I think the Bears it basically got what you said, a little bit more juice, just a little bit more of a dynamic weapon to add to that running back room where they and we talked, you know what, yesterday we talked to uh, our guy, Bo Wolf on, uh, on CHGO and, you know, cause obviously he covered uh, DeAndre Swift's season in Philly and he was like, you know, Swift was surprisingly good between the tackles. Like he was better than expected running between the tackles. Obviously he gives you that stuff on the outside, uh, can catch the ball, pass protection, still an issue. So I don't know if the bears have really gotten better in that area for the running back spot, but maybe this offense won't, require the backs to you know have to make as many key blocks back there as as uh the previous scheme did we'll, we'll see well if you're looking for a running back to help create mismatches for you mm -hmm. just in terms of different formations moving guys around like post or pre-snap deandre swift can provide that more than khalil herbert he, he just can the guy has almost 200 catches in, in four years like, that's something. And yep. so what does this mean for Herbert? Well, I mean, he's obviously under contract. I don't think the Bears want to get rid of him immediately, nor nor should they. He is still a valuable part of that running back's room. It's good to have depth there. One injury to a running back's room and everything changes. Um, so I still think Herbert still has value. But Swift is your number one right now. We know Roshan Johnson was a draft pick last year that the Bears just absolutely revered and praised since day one. And, you know, he's moving up the depth chart as well. Yeah, we'll see how that battles out there for that two spot. But, you know, I think I think this is just a little bit more burst. A running back who's going to stress the defense a little bit more. It's not a major upgrade. Swift's still only 25 years old. I mean, he's but he still, is an upgrade. I, yeah. I would, yes. No, without a doubt. Um, and I like it because it's not. I mean, did you did you overpay a little bit? Probably, but you always overpay. I guess first, free agency, yeah. the first day in free agency. But it's not like you 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 killed yourself here with this contract. Like it's not a lot of it's still not a lot of money. Like the piece of the pie in the salary cap, to me, the benefit or the let's just call it the possible benefit, outweighs whatever. I mean, worst case scenario, doesn't work out. This isn't going to hurt you against the cap in 2025, and you'll probably be out of it in 2026. So it doesn't really matter that much. But in terms of working out, I, I would consider this a low risk move in a sense. And that's what yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I, I yes, Swift has had injuries, but the mileage is considerably less than some of the free agent running backs who got more than him. And I think that's like important just in terms of investment in the position. Well, and look at it like this, even um, you know, on the surface. No strings attached. Would you rather have Aaron Jones or DeAndre Swift? Well, maybe Aaron Jones. But... <laughs> right, right, right. But where I'm going with this yeah. is Swift, despite his injury concerns, was very healthy last year. He was very durable for the Eagles. So he kind of put some of those injury concerns behind him. And he's younger. Whereas Aaron Jones struggled to stay healthy last year and is almost 30 years old. So. Yeah, is Aaron Jones the better running back? Sure, but where are you putting your money? And you can understand why the Bears went this route because remember the whole Aaron Jones thing played out after they had already agreed to terms um, with DeAndre Swift, and then you got Bears fans like, oh, why did they make the move so early? They could have had Aaron Jones. It's like, well, even if they knew they could have, and maybe they did, maybe they saw that coming. Who knows? I mean, good front office is correctly identify players who could be cut a few days or maybe even a week or two into free agency. Um, 
And I, I just think the Bears, I, I, I like this Swift signing. I don't have a problem with it at all. Uh, yeah, yeah. To your point, the age and mileage are important, not only to me, but I think very important to to what Ryan Poles wants to do in terms of well future projections. Because this is what it is. It's not what he did in the past. Well, that's part of the evaluation. It becomes part of the contract. You're also projecting what he could be in your offense. So give me the younger, potentially more productive, on the field more player. Yeah, and, and and I gotta be honest, like I don't even necessarily think he's gonna run for a thousand yards again. But if he gives you eight fifty, oh, I think he can flirt with a thousand. Absolutely. Well, I think I think he can, but I guess my point is like he doesn't even need to for this to be a successful signing. Actually, I I, I that's where I would disagree with you. I, I think because if the Bears are shifting offensively and Justin Fields again, I don't wanna have go down the quarterback route yet in this conversation, but if Justin Fields and what he can provide you with with his legs is no longer part of your offense, I think you want your running backs to combine for a good 1,600, 1,700 yards on the ground, if possible. Sure. Yeah, that's probably true. But again, if he can give you like 850, 900, catch the ball 30 to 40 times, which those are realistic numbers, especially the Catches yeah, to me. I think you're probably putting those as your floor a, a little bit. Like that's kind of what I'm doing. That's yeah. kind of what like I'm trying to set a floor that's somewhat realistic and make the point that for that money, it's still money well spent. So how about like 1,400 total yards? Okay, that's fifteen. So that's like a thousand. You're thinking like a thousand rushing yards and 400 receiving. Yes, something around there. You know. See so receiving 13, yards. 50. His receiving yards actually went down last year. Thirty nine catches, two fourteen. But um, at his max in twenty twenty one with the Lions, he caught sixty two balls for four hundred and fifty two yards. So and he had almost four hundred. Yeah, he, he had almost four hundred yards receiving in twenty twenty two as well. I, I, I just remember my thoughts when the, the the Lions first drafted him out of Georgia. Like, I thought he was going to be a problem for the Bears. It wasn't that the time where they're kind of shifting away from. Was Agent Peterson on that team then? Might have been. Might have been. Let's look. Let's look. But they ended up, you know, they ended up trading him. And then he ended up having a a good, <coughs> durable season. Yeah. The Adrian Eagles. Peterson was on the Lions at 35 years old. And he was their, well, their lead back. When DeAndre Swift was a rookie. That's crazy. That's one of those, like, you forget where a legend ended up in his career. It's yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Ken Griffey Jr. did play for the White Sox. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, it's a good example. Um, all right. Let's shift then to the safety position. And Kevin Byard, this was pretty decent money. Um, and obviously something the Bears wanted to take care of before free agency technically opened on Monday morning. Kevin Byard had been released, so he was uh, uh, eligible to sign early. This one's official. Um, the Bears had him in for a visit over the weekend. And ended up signing him on Sunday. It's a two-year, $15 million contract. So that averages out to uh, $7.5 million. And um, Kevin Byard has been a good player, was a good player for the Tennessee Titans for a while. He's definitely on the older end. He is already uh, on his way towards 31 years old, which is where he'll be playing this year at. Um and he had a, he got traded in the middle of last season and really did not play that well for the Eagles. But there was a lot of stuff going on there in Philly. They changed the scheme. Matt Patricia takes over. It was a mess. Um, so I don't know how much of the Eagles days you really want to even consider in all this. Obviously, the Bears didn't seem too concerned about this. But even if you're going to talk about it from an economic standpoint, they replace a veteran uh, safety and Eddie Jackson, who would have cost more than this entire contract over the course of one year, and they get 
basically replace him with, honestly, if you look at the PFF numbers, a player who's been better and more durable um, over the last four or five seasons for half the price. And they get him for two, you know, under a two-year contract. So just from a money standpoint, it makes sense. Even if your expectations on what Kevin Byard still is are tempered a little bit. Well, I think this is a, a situation where like the evaluation starts by comparing him to the player he's replacing. Eddie Jackson and him are the same age. Um, Eddie Jackson and him have, have made a lot of interceptions in their career. I think Byard, he's got the more all pros. So the consistency is probably on Byard's side. But then, like you said, it's the money, it's the durability, and it's the tackling ability that I think we need to highlight just in terms of like replacement and what the bears are getting. Like if there's one thing you could count on, I think you're getting a better tackler out of the new guy, as opposed to the old guy. And that is significantly important for what Matt Eberfus wants to do or have in his defense. So is he going to be an all pro? No, I, I think you hope that Jalen Johnson, Jaquan Brisker, Tyreek Stevenson, Kyler Gordon, they reach all pro level. You're young guys. But Bayer could still be that veteran in the back. He could be the communicator you want him to be. He could bring that experience to the room. And he can be a better tackler than Eddie Jackson. Like, that's your expectation, that he will tackle better than Eddie Jackson in the open field. So, and this is kind of where I thought this would go, right? This is This is decent money, but again, not money that really hurts you. In the short or long term, you have plenty of cap space this year. You can get get out of it in the future. So you're not really tying anything up here long term. And you're as as young as this defense has gotten and as exciting as it is, you still need veterans. And there was a concern, I can tell you, while it made sense to move on from Eddie Jackson, there was a concern about what you're losing there from a leadership standpoint. Now, you don't always replace that right away with somebody who comes from a different locker room, but Kevin Byard um, has some ties to some players on this team, like Demarcus Walker, who used to play with. So, And he's obviously a well-known commodity within the league. So I think he's going to be able to step in there um, and become, you know, that replace that veteran presence that, that Eddie Jackson had. And that was also probably a big part of why the Bears made this a priority because they knew they had to replace that element as well. The resume matters. It matters in the locker room. You have two all-pro, first-team all-pro appearances and two Pro Bowl votings, however you want to call that. <laughs> it's been the two Pro Bowls. Like, that's important. Like, that brings you a little bit of clout in a new locker room. The Bears know what they're getting. If any of these guys, any of these Young players, watch film, study other players. I'm sure Bayard has come up. He's been one of the best defensive backs over the past, I don't know, seven, eight years. So that's immense value, like immediate value that's brought to the Bears locker room. So, and before I move on, I just think this is important because I think at this point, you and I have done this long enough that we know that a lot of times you end up talking about these signings right after they're made. You're like, oh, this is good. This is great. This is the, and then like, 25% 25% of free agent signings actually pay off in the long term. So I think that's why it's important. Like as we talk about this, I think it's more about the process. I, I can see these two moves that we've talked about so far are justifiable. I'm also trying to temper the expectations because realistically a 31 year old safety is he going to play every game over the next two seasons for you? Probably not. Probably not. Um, and same thing when we were talking about DeAndre Swift. Yeah, it'd be nice if he runs for a 1,000 yards this coming year. That'd be great if he duplicates that. I, I think it's possible, but I think you almost have to look at this more of like, what's the floor? And if you are at that floor, are you going to regret the contract? And I think in both of these cases, the reason why I'm okay with both of these signings and somewhat optimistic about them is because I don't think the Bears will regret these contracts either way. I don't don't think it hurts them if the worst-case scenario happens. They're fine going forward. These aren't crazy deals. No. By any means. No. 
Um, same thing with the next player as we uh, move to Gerald Everett. Um, who I already shared on Twitter and on uh, CHGO yesterday, my Fishbane fun fact on this one. Oh, I think I missed it. Ooh, do you know? Well, I'm, okay, apologies to listeners who have already heard this probably two or three times, but John's is not. Do you know Gerald Everett was drafted 2017 Number 44 mm. overall, one pick I ahead did, of. I, I did see this. Adam Shaheen. Yes. I think the Bears were interested in Gerald Everett, too. But the Rams took him. Then the Bears drafted. It's a classic Everett. case of overdraft because your board wasn't prepared. No, well, maybe. Is Josh Lucas coming on Friday? We can ask him. I, I believe story. we can ask him. Yeah. yeah. I think he's coming on Friday. We can ask him what happened there. I believe uh, he actually has strong thoughts on this election as well. Yeah, I think he does. I believe, <laughs> I believe he does. Uh, Gerald Everett, though, at this point, um, this is an example of kind of our first obvious example so far for agency of the Bears signing somebody with ties to a coach that they just hired. Uh, Shane Waldron was with Gerald Everett in L.A. and then also in Seattle. Um, Everett's been with the Chargers the last two years, put up pretty decent numbers, and the way you got to think about this one is he is replacing Robert Tanyan. So you're giving him a little bit more money than you were paying Robert Tanyan. But Robert Tanyan basically gave you nothing last year. <laughs> it, 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 it was, uh, it, it was just not a good signing. Again, didn't really hurt you from a money standpoint, but it did hurt you in a lack of production standpoint. And it really put a lot of stress on Cole Komet who had an outstanding season, but was basically playing two tight end positions at the same time. And by the end of the year, that last game against the Packers, the dude was so beat up. Um, And then we found out at the Super Bowl, literally had a cast on his arm because he uh, had, had fractured a bone in his, in his forearm uh, in that last game. So you got to, preserve your players at the same time. And Gerald Everett is going to give the Bears another option here where Cole Komet can... It takes the stress off Cole Komet. And you're talking about an offense with Shane Walder and he likes to use two tight end sets. And this is, to me, a considerable upgrade. If you're assigning Gerald Everett as like your number one tight end, you're like, we got to get 70 catches out of this guy. Not a good signing. But for what the Bears are signing him to be, to replace Robert Tanyan, he should be a major upgrade. As a second tight end option, I mean, his numbers are are good. I mean, I mean, if that's... Yeah. He's been consistently productive throughout his career. Like, starting in his second season, he got 33 catches, 37 catches, 41 catches, 48 catches, 58 catches, and then 51 catches. The production has been there. So when he set new career highs in 2021, that was with Shane Waldron's uh, Seattle Seahawks offense, where they both went to Seattle from Los Angeles together. Set new career highs. I believe surpassed them um, later by going back to Los Angeles, this time with the Chargers. But you like the production. Um, it runs mean. I mean, there are some highlights of him running over guys. Robert Tanyan wasn't providing that last year at at this point in his career. He wanted he wanted to move tight end out of him. He just didn't move well, given his his injury history. Right, that's just the the facts. That's just what happens. Um, obviously, Luke Getzey liked him because of the Packers connections, but he wasn't the same player he was for the Packers. Gerald Everett has been consistently productive everywhere he's been with different offensive coordinators, different play callers, and obviously there's connections there with Shane Waldron, which makes this less risky in a sense. That's what GMs always tell you. You sign players you know, and Shane Waldron knows. I mean, he was his position coach before with the Rams. He knows him well. Yeah, he's been pretty durable, too. Um th- Again, bat- like same thing with Byard, like the resume, right? This is just... It's 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 a it's a big upgrade over Robert Tanyan. Um, and it's not for crazy money and it's not gonna hurt you in the future if it doesn't work out. 
So it's kind of the theme here. Like I, I think you look at um, Bears fans that maybe are wondering why the Bears haven't done more, why they haven't spent huge money. They got all this cap space. They need more help. Like I get it, but every single one of these moves seems to be relatively calculated. You know, and we may look back on it two or three years and be like, again, I don't know. Did any of these guys make an enormous impact? We'll see. Maybe, I mean, maybe not. A lot of times that happens. And I always remember like uh, that one free agent class that Ryan Pace had that like had like Marcus Wheaton in it. You know, like he's, he sounded like you were saying that he won free agency. You just liked that he was aggressive and filling holes. But like Ryan Poles told everybody years ago that he was going to build his team through the draft. Yes. Let's remember that. And I know we still have a safety um, to talk about. You want to get to him before I give you my grand thoughts on Ryan Poles' master plan? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about Jonathan Owens real quick. Two years, four and a half million, small contract, safety depth, right? Right. Okay. Are we done with Jonathan Owens? <laughs> I thought you'd be doing backflips over the signing. Oh, well, you know, we might do some gymnastics as we try to get excited about this one. Oh, I mean, look, so the, yeah, the headline here, Simone Biles' husband, she had some nice tweets yesterday about Chicago. She seems excited about not having to go to Green Bay anymore. Who isn't? Well, we still have to go to Green Bay, but, and I, I like guess, Lambeau Field. I guess she still needs to go there once this year. Uh, but yeah, this is uh this is safety depth. Jonathan Owens had to play a lot more last year um than I think was originally planned. Past couple of years. Yeah. Um but this is a solid depth piece, right? In twenty twenty two, this was this is what I was looking up when it seemed like I wasn't like, paying attention to you. I was paying attention, just only partially. It's all right, I'm used to that on my other show too. For the Houston Texans, Jonathan Owens played 83% of the defensive snaps for the Houston Texans in 2022. So that was like his, his significant increase where he went to starting 17 games, became a first time starter that year. And, you know, it's maybe he's getting better. Maybe he finds a role. Um, he did if you find the video, like have one of those late hits on Justin Fields when Justin Fields was sliding last year. Remember that? Not according to the referees. No, no. It's fine. It's completely legal. Um, it was a legal hit in that moment, but um, that's on his resume. I mean, I'm sure that stood out to the Bears some capacity. If you want to find a good reserve, he's a cheater. <laughs> he's willing to hit hard at him. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, still bitter about Justin not getting to any a single personal foul call the entire year. Yeah, that's true. Still confirmed. R- remarkable. Um. So then the Bears are now signing the guys that that took those hits. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. So there's your your four at least as we're recording this on Wednesday morning. The the four big free agent signings that they've made so far. Um, do you think as you transition here into your uh, evaluation of the grand plan of Ryan Poles here that they were in on anybody huge? I'm, I'm sure th- like, like Christian Wilkins I'm talking about define in well that they've negotiated that they you know at least reached out to the agent and said we're oh, willing yeah. to offer I, this I'm sure a lot of them I, yeah. teams probably have more conversations with agents th- th- than you know of um, I know they were in on Saquon Barkley I'm sure they touched base with Wilkins and Hunter you, you, you have to you have to get a good gauge of the market for your own evaluations, for your own like bookkeeping per se, as you forecast for this year and beyond. But um, just in terms of like the investment, like th- this is two years in a row now where we've seen Ryan polls target veterans for non premium positions. That does that make sense to you? Like, yeah, linebacker spent a lot of money on linebacker last year, but linebacker, well, valued highly by the Bears, it's still not a premium position, but he got capable ones, upgrades for his defense by paying linebackers, not in premium position. 
Um, guard, Nate Davis, spent money on him, non-premium position. This year, tight end, non-premium position. Safety, Jonathan Owens, backup, I know, non-premium position. Running back, non-premium position. He spends money in a very targeted approach on capable veterans to fill, to fill out his roster that way. Like the investment in premium positions comes through the draft or through trade. Like the Marcus Walker counts in a sense, but that wasn't a major deal last year. It just wasn't. The major investment for Ryan Poles has been trading for Montez Sweat and then signing him for to a big deal. It's, it's throwing or demanding that DJ Moore, a receiver, a premium position, be part of a major trade. It's already under contract. That's where the investment has come from. Like, I believe Montez Sweat belongs in this conversation here. Like, Jalen Johnson belongs in this conversation here. Like, there's already been money spent. Yeah, there's been a lot of money spent. A lot of money spent. Like, Montez Sweat, premium position, traded for and then signed. Jalen Johnson, cornerback, premium position, retained, not traded, despite a trade request, re-signed to a deal that puts him in the upper echelon of his position. Like, there's been investment made in premium positions just because they didn't go splurge on Hunter or Wilkins doesn't mean there wasn't money spent by the Chicago Bears. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Now, I want to talk about two positions, though. One that um, I still consider to be premium, maybe not as premium, because one is more premium just sort of in this scheme defensively, and the other one would be more like your number two wide receiver compared to top-end wide receiver, but still wide receiver. The Bears let Darnell Mooney go. No surprise. What was a surprise, he's got $39 million from the Atlanta Falcons. And that was a big. That was a big deal. That was more than probably, I would have thought. Probably more than the Bears offered him before last season. Right, and I think we all thought, "Wow, Darnell Mooney probably made a mistake by turning that down." Well, maybe not. Did pretty well. Um, there was a very interesting tweet. Let me see if I can pull that up here in the meantime while I while I try to stall. Um, and then the other one I wanted to bring up too is. Uh, Justin Jones, he got a who, good deal. who is you know kind of started to take a back seat last year, but was definitely a solid player for the Bears for two years. He got paid big by the Arizona Cardinals, more money than I would have thought. I don't have it right in front of me, but I was like, whoa, that was a considerable raise for him. So those are two spots where the Bears did lose players. They need to fill those spots. And so I think if you're going to look for a couple areas where you can be a little bit critical, and I'm not saying they should have spent that money to keep those players. I'm just saying, because I think those are probably overpays in both spots. But you got to, where's that replacement coming from? And is that going to be, I'm just getting wild here, but we know the Chargers need to release some players today. Does Keenan Allen suddenly become available? You know, what types of cuts like that are the Bears still hoping happen here where all of a sudden they can get access to a guy? Bring back Cleo Mack? I'm not saying that, but certainly he's a good player. Remember when he had six sacks in one game last year? That was cool. Mm -hmm. Remember when he sacked Aaron Rodgers with his butt? I do. That was fun. Vice presidential candidate Aaron Rodgers. Remember that? That um, happened. Um, wait, 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 wait. D don't just throw that in there because <laughs> my my first thought when I saw that was not any type of like, wait a minute, he's going to do what? He's going to become vice president. It was, did the Jets need a quarterback then? Well, if, he, if he's up and run the country, yes. Okay, Aaron Rodgers is not going to be running this country. This would be very clear. I said help. Help. He's not even going to be close to winning the election. But he, I, I mean, unless something crazy has happened here, I don't see how he can play football and run for vice president at the same time. <laughs> Multitask. But 
Um, yeah, now I lost. I, you, you were about to. Oh, here's the tweet from Warren Sharp at Sharp Football. Nearly 40% of deep targets to Darnell Mooney have been inaccurate in his career. Over that span, the number one most accurate quarterback on deep targets, which is 20 plus yards downfield, is Mooney's new quarterback, Kirk Cousins. So do you take that as a criticism of Justin Fields? Oh, yeah. I mean, what else? Because that's the quarterback he's played with the most. Yeah. I mean, not Mooney's entire career, but the last three years. Yeah. Um. And, and I mean, that's just a that's just a number, right? Like it's not really. I guess there's probably some subjectivity in what's considered an inaccurate throw, but forty percent of deep targets inaccurate. I'm guessing that that's whether you're going off the tape and seeing that, or you literally have analytics and they probably do have some type of analytical numbers like that, that they're looking at in their department. When the Falcons decide to make that move and sign Darnell Mooney to that contract, that's the type of matching up you try to do. Um, I mean, how else do you view this? Look, Luke Getze got another OC job. Darnell Mooney just got paid despite a terrible season. Well, Ryan Pace is there, but yes, like, Terry Fontenot has to be on board with paying him $39 million too. It's just that there's, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know how else you're supposed to take this stuff. One quick thought on the three technique. I do think that's a premium position in the bears defense. Now, you know, how they address that remains to be seen. I, I do think the investment was made with the second round pick in Jervon Dexter. So now at this point, on Wednesday morning, there seems to be an emphasis on his development, at least you and I talking here. But we know that's going to be the case throughout the offseason. Um, to go back to the big conversation, sorry, I just wanted to get th those thoughts in there. Um, and we have seen Ryan Poles be aggressive somewhat, whether it's Larry Ogajobi a few years ago and then going back after the, the failed physical and then going after Justin Jones. But I do think there will be investment made in the draft defensively we'll see what happens but back to this quarterback conversation i mean this this hangs over everything doesn't it and you've probably talked about it how many hours of your life over the past three days uh, <laughs> we're at least up to six and a half and that's just with a microphone in front of my face yeah yeah so it's too many hours yeah y you know what I think, like, to me, like, the big predicament is, do I think the Bears are going to trade fields? Yeah, probably, eventually. I don't think the market was there. Like, coming out of the combine, like, we knew the market wasn't there. Mm -hmm. We know that Ryan Poles has no leverage. We know he still has a lot to figure out about Caleb Williams, Drake May, and everyone else in the quarterback class. The pro days haven't even happened, other than Bo Nix. But... It's a long process. I, I, sometimes I think the whirlwind that is the negotiation window now just makes everybody so impatient. When the truth is, the NFL offseason is a long one. And sometimes quarterbacks, young ones like this, won't be moved, if at all, until closer to the draft. When Ryan Poles regains some leverage. When teams full picture of these draft quarterbacks really start to crystallize. There's a lot of information to gather. Visits to house hall, visits to other facilities, private dinners, pro days. So many things are still yet to happen with these top quarterbacks. It's a long process. I think Ryan Poles is okay being patient. And to say again, to repeat, I, I think the hustle and bustle of the opening days and negoti negotiation window create like this very unique impatience to like, let's get this done. No, I don't think it's going to work that way. We knew coming out of the combine it wasn't going to work that way. Yeah, but that's, but don't you think if there was a stronger market yeah, coming out yeah. of the combine, like this move would already been made? Probably. So Probably. that would be what your first, second round picks. 
teams were going to do that, not coming out of the combine. Right. But my, I guess my point is it's still a pivot on the Bears' part to now be like, oh, well, let's now be patient. I think that it was, it was always a scenario that they had to consider. Oh, I'm sure they did. But, I mean, it's... I, I don't think that that was their, uh, their first scenario. It was the scenario they're kind of forced into now. Well, I think, to your point, the first scenario where Ryan Poles indicated he wanted this done yesterday, mm -hmm. and which is a sooner than better... Sooner than later is better situation. Like it didn't that didn't crystallize for him for a lot of reasons. But the market, the market, the NFL, will, other teams define that. Yeah. Not the well. Chicago let me Bears. also say this too. This market's wrong <laughs> because <laughs> you can't tell me that Sam Darnold's better than Justin Fields. You cannot tell me that Gardner Minshew's better than Justin Fields. I think my argument for this, just to play devil's advocate, because I agree with you. I would almost argue that like the proliferation of the Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan scheme is now working against Justin Fields, given his two years of experience in it. I agree. And I would also say part of that's his fault because he has not shown an ability to consistently throw on time. And that's what the scheme requires. Right. Right. And it, that, that scheme is just in terms of the teams you just mentioned or the quarterbacks you just mentioned. Darnold is in Minnesota. That's an extension of that tree. Lugetzi, an extension of that tree now in Las Vegas with Gardner Minshew. Atlanta, Kirk Cousins, complete, same scheme. Right? Like, like it's, it's everywhere. And at this point, I would say that works against Justin Fields' trade market if the Bears are trying to trade him. But I like even having said that and being critical of Fields uh, weaknesses, which we both have been here on this show. I would even make the argument that giving your guy, Kirk Cousins, a four year, one hundred eighty million dollar deal. And I realized it's not the full deal. It's more like a two year, whatever the guarantees were. It's still an insane amount of money and a much higher cap head. You cannot tell me that that money for a player that's played in four playoff games and only won one of them is going to be that big of a difference in terms of wins and losses compared to if you just went the cheaper route with Justin Fields. Well, here's, I don't know why I'm the one playing the advocate today, but let me continue. Um, I'm Terry Fontenot now. Sorry, Arthur Blank. I, I'm going to tell you that in 2021, I didn't like him. I passed on him. I gave you all the reasons why we didn't like him, despite his connections to Georgia, despite this being his home state. Here are the list of reasons I didn't like him then. Oh, I was wrong in 2021. Now I like him. Now I think he's a better quarterback. I get that things change, but that is uh That's a difficult situation for a general manager, is it not? I mean, yes, but you can also yeah. I mean, yes, I understand the optics of that don't look good. Um I I still just I just think it's wild that This, this, these many teams are just, and then, then now you have the people out there who just think he's never been on the market. And that's actually what it is that these, these teams aren't passing on Justin Fields. They just, the Bears oh, have no, never no, been trying to no, trade no, him. Now, uh, yeah, Ryan that's the, that's want the to trade him and, and he's, he's going to, yeah, to keep him and now build around him despite the rest of the league not wanting him, that, which seems like it's a bad process. Well, right. The rest of the league telling you that 
your quarterback isn't a starter, which again, I don't agree with. I think he is a starter. But the rest of the league telling you that he's not a starter should not be a reason to not draft his replacement. Yeah, there's no logic in there. But is there a world where they have to pivot to keeping him even with Caleb Williams on the roster? Kevin and I, Kevin Fishbane and I talked about that in theathletic.com this morning. Check it oh, out. Check it out there, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns. All right. Well, we'll continue to monitor this as it plays out. Um. But in the meantime, the Bears will uh, introduce some of these free agents, I think, later in the week at House Hall. And uh, we'll be back on Friday, planning on talking to Josh Lucas again, get his take on how this whole thing's been playing out, where he's at in some of these quarterback evaluations, because he spends a lot of time looking at them um, as we get closer and closer to the draft and some non-quarterback evaluations as well. Uh, We got pro days that are rolling. Bears were... At Oregon yesterday with a big contingent in mass. Uh, apparently, Chris Morgan is at Georgia's pro day today. Although Marius Mims isn't actually working out, neither is Brock Bowers. But they have a center. Um, who has a center? Georgia, a good center. The Bears also have a center, apparently, in Ryan Bates. Um, draft the guy. Yes, please, <laughs> please, for the love of God. That's a draft. quite uh, that, that is a. Uh... I imagine going from Oregon to Athens, Athens, Georgia would require a private jet. <laughs> Maybe Dan Lanning's private jet. That's he did the reverse commute on that one. He went from Georgia to Oregon. Oh. One of Chris and now he's doing, miles. doing a pretty good job at Oregon. Um, apparently, though, the Bears were also at Oregon State's pro day. Talis Fuaga, who I like a lot. Tackle. If I told you right now they drafted Fuaga number nine overall and moved Darnell right to left tackle, what would your reaction be? It's investment in premium positions. I'm all for it. There you go. Because I don't know that Fuaga can go to left tackle. I think the move would probably be move Darnell right over there. But we got more time to talk about that as we get closer and closer to the draft. All right, we are out of here. Please follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue, at Adam Johns, at Hogan Johns is our show account. HoganJohns.com is where you can buy all of our merch, including this polo I'm wearing today. Please go check it out. We appreciate all the love and support. Hit subscribe on YouTube. Please hit the like button as well if you're watching there. And if you're listening the old-fashioned way as a podcast, please rate and review the show. Please send the link off to a Bears fan of uh, that you know. Help spread the love and the show. Continue to make it bigger and better. We pre- greatly appreciate your help in doing so. We will be back on Friday. We'll talk to you then. See ya.